Uh, good afternoon. Hi there. Uh, welcome and thanks for coming to a panel called Political Science uh, at the NSF. Um, we have a bunch of ground to cover today and a couple of reveals, so uh, I'd like to get to it. Um, you may have heard some rumors. Uh, we are not ending political science funding at the National Science Foundation, uh, but we are looking away for a way to go on offense and to change a funding trajectory that has been unfavorable. So, so we'll get to that. But the first thing I want to do is just uh, express some gratitude. Um, first to, to all of you for what you do. Um, political science is hard to explain to some people. Uh, you probably all have relatives uh, or other people that you've met. But it's, um, it's a pretty high calling. It's a tremendous form of service where we uh, look into ourselves, we look into our communities, and with those inquiries, we have this amazing opportunity to improve quality of life uh, for people whose circumstances we can understand and people whose circumstances we can barely imagine. Um, you know, when we're at a conference here, it's, it's an amazing privilege to be able to be with so many people who are looking at the world in so many different ways. It's easy to forget about all the people who will never go to an academic conference, uh, will never go to a, a university, and yet for some of them, for many of them, the work that we do is their last best hope. Uh, I've traveled to parts of the world where I've seen some you know, horrible things at scale. And you know, to have people ask you, what should I do? And to have all of you in the room with, with me and other people at that time, and to watch you know, uh, things like poverty and infant mortality and childhood malnutrition and civil wars and neighborhood, uh, neighborhood strife and to see the possibility that our work can change it. It's a really dynamic thing and it's something that we never lose sight of and it's something that we fight for every day. And we do have to fight for it because the words political science, um, the meaning isn't obvious. And while I'm at that point, I just want to make one more point about when we're at a conference. Uh, we all know each other, we see each other, we have various relationships. Let's not forget the folks who can be invisible, who are around us right now. There are people who set the chairs, there are people who arrange the tables, there are people who arrange this room, and they're not invisible. We're all one family and we need to take care of each other. Right? So as you're walking around the conference going to, to your next panel, please, whatever you think what's going to happen in the next hour and a half, please make an effort to recognize everyone in this building who helps make an event like this happen. Because none of us are more important than anyone else. It, it, it takes all of us to make these things happen. So moments of gratitude, I think, are, are very important. Um, we have a positive vision for the social sciences. We have a positive vision for political science. But we need to go on offense. We've been playing defense for too long. And keep your head down isn't a strategy. right? So we have an amazing portfolio, we have an amazing dynamic discipline, and we have some ideas about how to move into a next step. So I want to introduce you to some people to whom I'm particularly grateful, and that's the NSF staff. I've been in a, at NSF for a year, and here's my 30-second si story about NSF. We had a government shutdown, as you may have heard. Um, we had people that were out of work and weren't paid for five weeks. And you know, we had phone trees and we tried to take care of each other and so forth, but you kind of wonder what it's going to be like when people come back, when you haven't been paid, when you're worried about your work, when you're, when you're worried about your mission. Is there going to be a lot of drama? Are people going to quit? You know, are people going to become cynical? And the thing that I can tell you about the people that work at the National Science Foundation is the day that we came back, everybody wanted to go. Everybody wanted to go full speed and to catch up. Not one person quit in our, in our directorate people bust their ass every day to try and do better tomorrow than they did today. It's an incredible thing to see. It's the most inspiring group of people I've ever worked with. Uh, and, and some of them are here. And they share something in common. They're all political scientists. Okay? So uh, Zarya Iqbal is in political science. And we're gonna, I'm going to introduce them and then they're going to tell you something about themselves. Uh, Faye Korsmo. Uh, me. Uh, Bob O'Connor. Uh, Reggie Sheehan, so we'll introduce in a second. And we've got others in the building uh, who aren't here. Uh, Cheryl Evie, who many of you know, who runs our, our methods, methodology, and statistics uh, program. Brad Gutierrez, who is at UCSD when I was there. He's the executive secretary of the National Science Board. The National Science Board oversees NSF, and they're very important to us. Their opinions really matter. 
Brian Humes, who can't be here, but he's written a letter, and I'll read it to you a little bit later. Um, but what I'd like to do right now, oh, and maybe some more, uh, but we'll get to that. Um, but what I'd like to do now is if we could go down the table and maybe tell us a little bit about what you do at NSF and maybe your, the, your path from getting a, a PhD in political science to what you do today. So here's Faye Korsmo. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Skip. Um, so yes, I'll step out a little bit here. Yes, thank you very much. So I work for the Office of the Director. I've worked for four directors, NSF directors. And they are all, I will tell you, extremely dedicated to social and behavioral sciences. Not one of them uh, made any denigrated remarks, which was good because I worked for them and I really didn't want to hear it. But anyway, uh, I'm sort of like the chief risk officer is what I call myself. We have a lot of auditors, a lot of people examining us all the time. Why are you making these crazy grants? What is this thing about basic research? So I'm kind of the broker between outside groups who are questioning us, inside groups who are questioning us, and there are several of them, including our inspector general and, and sometimes our own, our own board, and the director and the uh, management, uh, which includes uh, Skip, of the agency. It's a great job. I, I uh, got my PhD in political science in comparative politics. I taught at the University of Alaska Fairbanks for several years, came to NSF as a rotating program officer in a little program called Arctic Social Sciences, because that was my research, is the Arctic and sub-Arctic. And uh, then I just stayed. So 22 years later, I'm still at NSF, and Skip's right, it's a great organization. So thank you all for being here. Hi, I'm Zaria. I am the political science program director. This is my second year at NSF. I came to NSF from Penn State. Um, a little background about me. I went to graduate school at Emory University where I studied international conflict and security. The trend at the time in conflict processes was to focus on causes of war. But by the time I started working on my dissertation, I became more interested in exploring the consequences of war and violence. Uh, also influenced by the work of CDC nearby, I wrote my dissertation on the impact of war on public health. Since then, I have remained interested in issues of human security, political violence, and societal vulnerabilities. Overall, I've been trained in empirical research in political science. My first faculty position was at the University of South Carolina. I was there for four years, and then 11 years ago, I moved to Penn State. At Penn State, I've been very um, pleased with, and I've really enjoyed being in a department that is very committed to social science. And I've gained a lot from being at a large and forward-looking institution. With respect to the story of my path to NSF, uh, it's both a professional and a personal one. Around the time I turned 40, I had sort of a growth spurt in my perspective on life. I became very focused on looking uh, for ways to give back and to offer service. I started volunteering a lot in my local communities and started thinking about ways to better situate myself to be useful and valuable to my professional community. To that end, I spent a year working very closely, full time, with the Penn State Provost, learning about central administration at Penn State. I also completed a year-long academic leadership fellowship with the Big Ten Academic Alliance. After those experiences, when I was offered the political science program director position at NSF, it seemed like the perfect opportunity to do work that focuses on the societal and broader impacts of what we all do as scholars. And in fact, something I've heard Dr. Lupia say truly encapsulates that sentiment. He said something to the effect of, our job at NSF is to work for people we haven't met, people who are not in this room and will never be in this room. So this job really allows me to serve a number of communities that I value 
the broader scientific community, my academic and disciplinary community, political science, and vulnerable populations and groups through the science that we support. It's that last one that makes me particularly excited to be doing what I'm doing. And I look forward to, con to us continuing to support research that's timely, important, and impactful. Thank you. Uh, it's difficult to follow these articulate spokespersons people. Uh, I'm going to do the background stuff first. Uh, I joined the, political, the American Political Science Association in 1965 when I was a sophomore in college at an all-male institution. People told me that that would be a good way to meet women. As it turns out, I was terribly misinformed. Uh, there were very few women at these meetings in the 1960s. Times have changed. Um, so I went to graduate school to in, in starting in um, 1967 because of Vietnam. Uh, and it turns out I loved it. I was with a cohort at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill with people like uh, John Sullivan and Jim Stimson. Uh, and we had a sense that we had all these powerful new methods. I, I worked with Ted Blaylock and Don Matthews and this methods, we're thinking, you know, we can create a better world of equal opportunity and equity and deal with these problems uh, by using these methods. Uh, it turns out, you know, I still believe that, though I underestimated the power of ideology and entrenched interest, to be honest. Well, next stage of life, I moved to Happy Valley, Pennsylvania State University. Uh, not everyone comes from North Carolina to uh, Happy Valley, but it stayed there for 30 years. Um, I became a rotator at the National Science Foundation in 2001 to uh, co-manage a program called Decision Risk and Management Sciences. Uh, there was then a vacancy then, and I went permanent in 2003. Um, my, that program has Nobel Prize winners. That tells you a lot about the program, all of whom we funded before they won the Nobel Prize. Danny Kahneman. Uh, you probably have heard of uh, Dick Thaler, behavioral economist, and Lynn Ostrom, political scientist, former president of this institution. Uh, I can tell you it's a wonderful place to work, and one reason I'm saying that is because there's a vacancy in DRMS, and there's a job announcement that just went out. Uh, and take a look at it. Uh, what else can I say? My job is to co-manage that program. I also do a heck of a lot of stuff outside that program, and there's really opportunities for funding. I'm on the working group of navigating the new Arctic. You might think, what could that possibly have to do with political science? Well, if you read the solicitation, last year's, I'm prohibited from saying anything about the new solicitation until it's out. Uh, one of the focus areas is the impact of the changing Arctic on the rest of the globe, and economic, political. Uh, so take a look at that solicitation when it comes out. What my point here is a little bit that political scientists need to be a little bit more like uh, Sutton, the bank robber. Uh, you, the famous quote, he was asked, why do you rob banks? He said, because that's where the money is. Well, never getting a new audit over five years has a minimum of $150 million, and probably more if proposals are strong. These are three, three million dollar awards for interdisciplinary work. Last year's was for two of the three, engineering, natural science, and social science. So anyway, there's a lot of opportunities for that type of thing. I guess my final note is that it's a, uh, I've been there for 18 years. I've never had a funding recommendation overturned. Uh, at any level. And I've never been told that we need to fund a particular proposal because some senator is on the war path. Um, that's never happened. So the decisions are made on the basis of the science. Does it have strong intellectual interest, uh, intellectual merit, and powerful water impacts?
Thank you. Uh, Bob's being very modest. No one in our division ever wants to speak after Bob. <laughs> he had like four lines over here and he turned it into 15 minutes. I'm not sure I can do that. Uh, my name is Reggie Sheehan. I'm the program director in law and social sciences. I've been there one year starting my uh, second year. I was a professor at Michigan State University doing research on U.S. Supreme Court, courts of appeals, and uh, high courts around the world. Um, I uh, retired in May from Michigan State University, and well, like May 2018, and this position came open, and within two months, I found myself at NSF, so it worked out uh, very well. I'll tell you a little bit about my pathway to it. Um, I think it's somewhat interesting. I was thinking about it this afternoon uh, when I was uh, thinking about remarks. I uh, did my PhD under John Sogart, University of South Carolina. At the time, he had received a pilot grant for the court of what would become the Court of Appeals database. Uh, I worked on that pilot grant and was funded by basically NSF. And eventually, he would write a proposal, a $600,000 proposal, to create a Court of Appeals database, which is still used even today. And I'm pretty old, so you can see it's been around a while. Uh, that database um, funded my research, so I was familiar with, uh, uh, funded um, my uh, graduate training, so I was very familiar with NSF early on. Uh, at that time, as any of you are know that are in law and courts, you couldn't get a job if you did a dissertation on the Court of Appeals, so I needed to do something on the U.S. Supreme Court. That's no longer true, but it was true at the time, and so he advised me to contact Harold Spate at Michigan State University, who had been funded by NSF. Uh, to create the U.S. Supreme Court database. At that time, uh, it was not publicly available. Harold had been working on it for a few years and receiving funding. He was gracious enough to send me a copy of it, and as far as I know, I wrote at least one of the first dissertations to come out of the uh, U.S. Supreme Court database in uh, 1990, when I finished my, my PhD. So NSF had a direct impact on my dissertation. I spent a couple years at the University of North Texas and then Michigan State recruited me and I can guarantee you almost 100% if Harold Spaeth had not wanted me to come to Michigan State, I would have not been hired. So again, NSF impacts my career in terms of being hired at, the, at a Big Ten University. I would eventually get involved in doing comparative judicial research and receive NSF grants, received several NSF grants over the years. So oftentimes I was interacting with NSF, it was impacting my career, it changed it from just U.S. Supreme Court studies to doing comparative judicial politics. So when it rolled around time that I was retiring and NSF came uh, to me and asked me if I'd be willing to come in as a program director, I was sort of shining the golf clubs up. Uh, I was ready for retirement. Uh, I was retiring early, uh, but I looked at this as an opportunity to, and you've heard others say this, a chance to give back to the profession, to give back to the field, to continue to have an impact in uh, law and courts uh, research, and also to give back to NSF. Um, NSF had had a dramatic impact on my career, and the chance to go back there and work for them uh, was something I was really looking forward to doing. I have to say, this is one of the best decisions I ever made in my life, and I made it very late in my career, but this is a very collegial group. It's the most collegial place uh, I've ever seen. I haven't worked at that many places, but I know of other places too, and I've enjoyed this past year uh, tremendously. Um, Skip's a wonderful assistant director, and he's gonna tell you about some of the things that uh, we're doing. In, all, in law and social sciences also, not just in, the, in just the political science program. And so I'm looking forward and excited about that future at NSF. Thank you. So uh, I get to work with, with these great people and lots of others like them every day. And so it's really, it's a great privilege. Um, so I want to start talking about what we're doing. And I might as well tell you a little bit about my own motivations, just quick. Uh, so I, my parents got divorced and I was, I was born right around the time that Bob joined APSA. <laughs> couple years later, my, yeah, couple years later, my parents got divorced and this is interesting because they decided to live in different places. So, um, uh, in the modal year, I spent the winter in Buffalo, New York and the summer in El Paso, Texas. Uh, let me figure that out. And then, uh, then my mom stopped moving and I went to a high school and a town with one stoplight. Uh, I worked at a farm and in a steel mill, 
and I'm the first person uh, in my family to go to a university. And it's, you know, I just watched my daughter graduate, so I'm all for clumped about that, because, like, you know, maybe, maybe we're on a winning streak. Uh, but anyways, um, you know, I, I just, I, I grew up in a culture like many of you where uh, service is kind of a focal point of what you're supposed to do and who you are, and particularly service for the people you can't see. And so if you want to know what motivates me on a daily basis or why when I got cold called 18 months ago and asked if I would do this, and f you know, first I thought they'd made a mistake, and then it was like, all right, maybe this is worth doing. So one thing I'll tell you about Washington, at least from my perspective, is it's, oh, there's a lot of amazing people here, but nobody gives you anything. Uh, you have to fight for it. You have to build coalitions, and you have to make a case for it. And um, I believe in what we're doing. I believe in how we do it. But nobody's going to give us anything. And so uh, the, what I'm about to show you is, is, is our, our plan to create a, a new path. So uh, I think one way to describe what we offer to people is clarity. And clarity can come in lots of different forms. Clarity can come in the form of there's this thing that's really complicated. But if you look at it carefully or from different perspectives, there's an essence that isn't apparent. And if you understand there's this essence, there's a lot of great things you can do for people. So that's one way of clarity. The other way of thinking about it, there's seats in the front if you, for you to come in. You don't want you to stand, so. Yeah, come on in. I won't tell whoever that you're late, but. <laughs> um, okay. The other, um, the other form of clarity is you take something that looks really simple <laughs> and, and you ask people to look at it again and say, you know what, it's not what you think it is and there's some layers there. And if you start thinking about the layers, maybe we have to do things or treat things differently. So clarity, I think, is what we produce with all our methods, with all our perspectives. That's, that's something we produce. And in 2019, particularly in places like Washington, D.C., clarity can be a scarce resource. And so people who can provide it in a legitimate, incredible way I think have some opportunities. Um, what I, I care about us, I've been a member of this association for a long time. I, I'm a proud member of this organization. Um, but I care about them. Uh, you know, that's just, that's just what it is. And you know, they, they can represent our students. They can represent people who our students influence. Uh, when I talk to my undergrads or my graduates, and they're like, well, you know, what should I do? And, I'm like, you know, there are people in your community right now with whatever skill set that you have that you can go out and help them today. Right, so that's a start. I wonder what should I do? But in political science, we have the ability to do that at scale, at an incredible scale in a way that no one else can do. And so, you know, what we do is, is the, the work that we're doing today uh, helps uh, build security in lots of different places. Uh, it can help people who are providing essential services to vulnerable populations understand and interact their, their contexts in much more effective ways. Uh, it can help you know, if we're building things, whether it's tech or infrastructure, understand how people use things. A common theme in Washington now I see is we, we deal with tech people and uh, you know, they want to build a great device and they don't think about the people, the social scientists until the very end. Like we're trying to like, how about at the beginning? Like how about, you know, when we're, pro where we're thinking about what we're optimizing, why don't we think about the downstream consequences and the people right from the beginning, right? And then teaching, right? So these, these venues and so many more are ways that we create value. And so I would say that the social, behavioral, and economic sciences today, I think what I'm about to say here is not controversial, uh, has a worldwide impact. Those of you who've worked in other countries, you know just how far this can reach, places you'd never imagine, right? It's increasingly rigorous and increasingly diverse. On diversity, we have a very long way to go, right? But we're working on it. And I think we can say today, we are more diverse than we've ever been in a previous day, right? So that's, that's momentum that we need to build. And we're increasingly integrated and networked. You know, we have, the, we have the stereotype of the scholar who's off in the ivory tower, and hey, if you like to live there, cool, that's great. But there are so many scholars that are engaged. There are so many scholars that are, are in their communities um, doing things, and what's more important, listening and learning and trying to observe so that instead of imposing on people, we can actually try and be of service, right? So you think about all these things, and, and you actually measure them and collect data on them. This should be the golden age of everything we do. It should be. I'd argue it is, but we have a little problem, right? designated by dark clouds. You know, there's a worldwide crisis of credibility. 
there are so many institutions of culture or knowledge of the arts where people are questioning fundamentally the value of things that for a long time we, and, and some of the questioning is legitimate, but some of it is, is removing the, the, the foundations of our ability to understand one another and to build relationships, right? Two questions are really apparent for people like us. And one is, why should we pay for what you do? Uh, because you all tell us things we already know, or you're all partisan, and so we shouldn't pay for that. And plus there's the internet where I can type in words and, and learn about anything I want for free. So I really don't need to pay you. The other question is why should we trust what you do? Because you all have motives. Some of you are at universities with big endowments. Uh, many of you appear to identify with a single political party and we're not sure that your scholarship escapes that, right? And so in this culture-wide crisis of credibility, we don't get a pass, right? And so these questions, when you're at a place like NSF or when you're at the American Political Science Association, they're not just theoretical. So what I want to show you now is a 20-year funding history of the Social and Economic Sciences Division at NSF. I'm actually, I can't, I don't know why, I'm not allowed to show you the political science budget, right? I, I don't, un, some, is that right? I can't, That's right? Correct. Yeah, so I don't know why, <laughs> but I know that I can't. But I'm going to show you a public number that I can show you. And so this is the Social and Economic Sciences Division. So that's one part of the social behavioral and economic sciences directorate. I'm not going to do a food chain or whatever. But it's the part with political science in it. So here's a 20-year trend. And what you could, this is in real dollars. And what I want you to notice is here's 2018. Here is the public number on 2019. I'm going to tell you a secret in a second. But what I want you to notice is in real dollars in 2018 and 2019, these are the lowest numbers in the series for over 20 years. There's been a steady decline. We were able to, so this is the reported number that came out. I can tell you since we're almost at the end of the fiscal year, we were able to acquire some leverage. Thank you, COSA and other people. Uh, and we were able to get the budget up. So the, the actual number is a little bit of a tick up. But in, this, in the last 20 years of this time series, the last two years are the lowest. The direct rate as a whole is down 15% in real dollars between 2015 and 2018. And the social, this is political science, is in this group. And political science, I can't, it has not been accepted. It has not been given some sort of waiver so that all the other programs, right? So if I could show you the political science budget, it would look like this, but it wouldn't look exactly like this because there's a chunky thing in the political science budget. I think I can say this. It's called the American National Election Studies. And some years it costs $6 million, and some years it costs 250000 But if you were to do a smoothing, uh, over it, it would look like this. So this is a real thing. This is a real outcome that affects our ability to support the research that changes quality of life. And you know, when I came to Washington, like, yeah, it's really sad that you know things happen. Your funding went down. And we feel bad about that. But at the end of the day, we have to build the case to change the, the trajectory. So here's the thing to note: the National Science Foundation has one funder. Sorry, it has one funder. All right. So I'm just going to show you visually what that funder looks like. All right. So they, they do a lot of great things there. And one thing they do is they, they send, they, they, they tell things to this group who gives instructions to this group. And then this group has a number of agencies under it. And we're one of them. Okay. So let me, let me talk about a, a circle of life or, or a cycle, if you will. Okay. So one thing to know about the NSF budget is once a year, even though I can't tell you things about exactly what it is, once a year we know what the NSF budget is. We know that at the beginning of a fiscal year, it is zero. Until legislation is passed, our budget is zero. This is not a metaphor, this is not analogy, this is legal, right? And if we have gotten a good portfolio of proposals, when we get to the end of the fiscal year, it should also be zero because otherwise we left things on the table. So this is, again, this is not an analogy, this is true. So every year we have to make the case to our single funder. So what this case looks like, again, uh, the United States of America sends money to Congress, known as taxes. Congress writes legislation uh, with the, the Congress scholars, I know everybody already knows this, but I'll just, you know, right? Uh, the Congress writes legislation that gets sent back and forth, it gets passed, then we get a budget. Right? We don't always know what date we're going to get the budget on, but eventually we, we tend to get one. And then uh, instructions and money come to us. 
But to make the case for funding, to get us off a of zero every year, the critical thing we have to do is tell this story. How is what we do not just nice, how is it essential to the core mission of the National Science Foundation within the federal government? And th our mission is to produce transformative outcomes that help the nation improve its quality of life, security, um, um, economic performance, right? These are the critical things. This is the story we have to tell. And funding is very competitive. We are competing with all the other parts of NSF and with every other federal agency whose budget starts at zero at the beginning of every year. So we don't have an endowment. We don't have, many of you are, you know, I'm at a university, I don't know what Michigan's endowment is, but we have a very lovely endowment that you know, if the, if the legislature were to go down, we, we're, we're not at zero. At NSF, we have no endowment, right? So we have to make this case. And so now what I want to talk about is how we're, how we're making the case. I'm going to show you three, three parts of it. So what we want to do is we want to increase the public value of the portfolio. I think the portfolio is great. We all think the portfolio is great. But if we have opportunities to increase the value, let's do that. But then the other thing we have to do is make the value more apparent. Because we have a PR problem. And by we, we'll get to who we mean, but uh, there's, uh, let me give you some numbers. Sarah Morell and I uh, did a study last year where we, um, this is before NSF called, it's all with publicly available data, where we uh, downloaded every word in every title and every abstract of every NSF grant for the last 30 years. And then we took, uh, there have been congressional criticisms of federally funded research. Sometimes they're waste books, sometimes they're letters. We collected all of those for the last 10 years. We took every word in those. And then what we did is tried to backwards engineer what words and sequences of words get you into waste books. That informs some of what you're about to see. But to give you some summary numbers, let me just tell you a little bit about what we found. In this data set, so these are all public, all, all public criticisms of individual research projects by members of Congress. There are about 450 of them total in the last 10 years. About half of those were from NSF, about 226. 96 of them were from the Social, Behavioral, and Economic Sciences Directorate, and 40% of those were from one program in the Directorate. We have about 50 programs in the Directorate. <laughs> we have about 400 programs in the Foundation, and we're a foundation that also funds climate change. So for a program to be the most questioned and criticized in that group is to a high degree of difficulty, all right? So this is a real challenge for us. So we're, what we're gonna ask you to do now is we're, we're talking about changing some things, but we need you to change. Actually, if you're thinking about applying for money, there are two changes we really need you to make. One is to learn how to use a couple new words, the names of new programs, and the other is this, and I'm just begging you on this one. There are two criteria for NSF that we use to evaluate proposals. And they both help us communicate with you, but they also help us tell the story to stakeholders. So one is scientific merit. And we're all pretty good at that. We're all like trained at that. And then there's broader impact. I love us, I love us, I love us. We're not very good at this one as a whole. So particularly young people, I love you, we wanna we want fund you. When we have to make a case for the budget, uh, the idea that um, I'm gonna go to a conference I'm going to fill a gap in a literature. Those aren't exactly the broader impacts that help us sell it. Okay? So the gap in the literature argument, just this, here's my math bias. There are infinite number of gaps in the literature. So the fact that you can fill one is not news. Right? The question is, why are you doing what you're doing? And so here's the, here's the ask I have. Write the broader impact statement you're writing now, but give me a sentence, give me two sentences at the end that tell me if work like this were to progress in a certain way, how it would help someone serve someone else. How it would help us help people in a community. How it would help us improve health outcomes. How it would help us uh, you know, bring stability, bring peace. Tell us how it would do that. That is what we need. That's how we build an ecosystem where it's easy to protect you. So in other words, this is an age-based thing. If you haven't seen Spinal Tap, I'm sorry. Um, we need the scientific merit to be pinned at 11 on a 10-point scale and we really need broader impacts at 11. Right now we're in the fours or fives on average, and that's rounding up, okay? We really need this. Regardless of whatever else happens, 
when you apply to the National Science Foundation, think about who you're serving. This isn't, this isn't a metaphor. This, isn't, this is the corpus by which we make the argument. We can go back in time and try and figure out the effects that things had, but you are much better positioned than anyone else to look forward from your perspective and tell us the reason I'm doing this. It, you might have lots of reasons for it. I get it. People have to get jobs. Like, no criticism of that at all. But in this food chain, a member of Congress or me has to go in front of, if you get a $50,000 grant, that's like a median household income. So someone's in a position of, of trying to say, well, the reason it's okay to forcibly take 50,000, you know, the, the, uh, the equivalent of median household income and give it to this person at this university is because we fund basic research, so we don't know if it's gonna work, but this work is so important that if it does, something amazing could happen. That is the argument, that is the field that we play in. That is the only way that we get money for folks. We need you to help us do that both when you write proposals, and in any time you have a chance to advocate, to be in public, to serve others, to talk about what you do. We just need to build that ecosystem. I understand if you're young, there's the everyday existential crisis of will I have a job. Uh, I'm gonna have office hours, I'll announce them on Twitter tomorrow, I'm gonna be in the lobby. If you want advice about that stuff, how to make, I'll do that, okay? But any you know, if, if you can just take a deep breath for 30 seconds and think about, okay, uh, I don't know whether I belong or not, but if this worked, who would it help? The more you can tell that story, the more it helps lots of people advocate for you. Part of this strategy, which I'm now about to show you, I ha there's a simple um, premise behind it. We want people to be able to advocate for your research, for funding it, whether it's our, at our uh, agency or otherwise. Part of what we're, I'm gonna show you here is a strategy to make it easier for people who wanna sing your praises and harder for people who wanna take cheap shots. Because I don't know if you've heard, but political science in, this, in some parts of this town works better as a punchline than as a headline. Uh, I was at a venue, uh, six, the, the, the National Science Foundation Gala, where we had award winners of the main prizes at the National Science Foundation. It was at the Mellon, it was black tie. I am gonna come to you. Uh, it was black tie, and we had, David Rubenstein was, was the MC, and he was you know, kind of being lovely and things like that. He, he's on TV, he's on Bloomberg, he's helping repair the Washington Monument. Anyways, he talked about his relationship to science. And one of his laugh lines was, well, I was an, a political science under, you know, does that count? Uproarious laughter, and even though I think there were 1,500 people, one discernible boo, Wendy Naus, I heard you on the other side of the room booing. It was you, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, but that goes here. Some of you who have been keeping track, there have been elected representatives from both parties who have felt free to use political science as, as a punchline. Okay, that's just the delt I was decked today. Uh, the delt, the, the deck I was dealt today. So let's go on offense. Let's figure out how to do this. So here's the strategy we have. It has three parts. One is a calm strategy. It's going on offense. A key part of going on offense is we're tell we're finding new ways to tell the story of SBE. You can find some of them on the internet. So we've made a web page which we will uh, we can give you the. It's called SBE Value, and now you can see stories about how SBE is changing people's lives. Well, there are three ways to talk about science. One is a linear science narrative where it's kind of every article we write, it's about the science. The second way of telling a science story is you tell a story about a scientist. Jane's a scientist and she's really awesome. We're gonna hear about her and that's why science is great. So we can talk about the science, we can talk about the scientist, and then the third way is talk about the person who science helped. Focus on them, elevate them, m help your reader be them, root for them, show something that's getting in the, aspirate, in the way of their aspiration, and then that's where we come in. We come in and help them take the next step on their journey. That is a story that people can hear, all right? So our comms, we are developing that. Um, we gave a talk to the National Science Board about a month ago that was a series of these, and the, the reaction was remarkable. I will show you a clip of this in a second. But we've turned people who didn't understand social science or doubters, they're now big advocates for us. Reposition the portfolio to make the value of research apparent. So what I'm about to show you is we're gonna talk about some changes to political science. It's one of nine changes we're making, okay? We're, we're changing a series of things at the same time, right? And the idea is to make the value of what you do more apparent so we can create more opportunity. And finally, partnerships. Um, so it turns out at NSF, we fund basic research. 
that's our, we, we can't fund applied research, right? Even if you send us something that can be applied, we have to talk about it in terms of it has many applications. So the cool thing about NSF is we have four principal assets. Tremendous brand equity, people like NSF. We have a license from Congress, that is we have money to fund basic research that might not work. We have a world-class peer review system that isn't perfect, but it is better than what many philanthropies have where you know, we love philanthropies, but some of them, you, know, you have a couple program officers and they know somebody and they know somebody and you get a grant. We have our process is a bit more rigorous than that. And then we have a well-informed research network such that we have, we have deep networks into every research university in this country. So we have those four things. Imagine what happens if you take somebody with those assets and somebody else who needs to fund applied work but doesn't have their, their syndicate, their funders won't let them fund the basic work. And suppose you want to create an ecosystem where you do the, the basic work to make sure that it works, and then you create the good stuff, the applied stuff that you can actually use. I am looking at building a series of funding partnerships where we fund the ugly stuff so that the amazing things can come to market quicker. And by market, I mean people, right? By market, I mean people's lives to try and accelerate the process. So that's what we mean by partnerships, okay? So um, the basis of our communication strategy is this phrase, your life our work, SBE. Why that? Because it's first about you. It's about the people we're serving. So here, you can, don't, you know, and I'm, I'm doing this to myself, later, not during class, uh, if you want to type uh, that, you can see the page with our, um, uh, with our value stories. But I want to show you, if I can, um, the reaction to the presentation that we gave at the National Science Board meeting. And uh, if this doesn't work in 30 seconds, I'm going to abandon it. Here we go. So this, I just want you to, sorry that I'm on the screen, but that will be over quickly. Uh, and if this doesn't. Board having been here longer than many others and having lived through a good bit of what we had so many questions for SBE and really frightful. Let me just say that this was the best presentation I have ever seen uh, come from SBE. It's huge change and I want to thank your team too. Sure. It gets the message across so clearly and the value so clearly that I I just, you know, I feel like standing up and applauding because it's just really good and it's, uh, those of you that know me being on the board, I don't come out and say this very often. Uh, I usually am the cranky one but this is really good and I just want to congratulate you and your team not only for the presentation but being able to just really find the golden nuggets in what, what you guys are doing successfully. Yeah. I, so the National Science Board is our oversight board. Like they actually matter. They can you know, direct us and tell us what to do. So this is the type of outcome we're trying to create and we're, we're finding success. Oh, there you go. We'll get that later. All right, so back to the big screen. So the repositioning. So uh, that's what we're talking about now. So what I want to show you is something that a lot of people don't know about NSF, okay? Why do we choose program names? Like how do we choose them, okay? So at the beginning in 1950, um, the National Science Board, actually their job was to review all the proposals. Like in the original legislation, that was their job. And then pretty quickly that became untenable so they delegated to some version of all of us, which has grown over time. But again, all of our budgets start at zero. So it turns out that what you name a program matters because you need people to advocate for you to, so that budgets can be non-zero and significant. So what I want to show you is a trend that's happened over time at the National Science Foundation. So I'm going to show you the names of every research program at NSF in the core directorates. We also have the big ideas. We also have things that span directorates. And of course, they wouldn't be named after disciplines because they're big spans. So these are the core programs. And I'm not going to cherry pick. I'm showing you all of them in the six research divisions. Okay? And so what you'll see is the, the funding programs that are named after disciplines will be in red. Okay? So first I'm going to show you here are all the programs in the Directorate for Biological Sciences. <laughs> see what the biologists uh, figured out a couple decades ago is that uh, people would advocate for them better if the programs were named after what they do rather than what they are but they're not the only ones in the building that figured this out. Uh, here is the Directorate for Computer and Information Science and Engineering. Computer science is everything now, right? All the kids, you know, they're the biggest major on a bunch of your campuses. 
Those are our core research programs in computer science. Their budget's over a billion dollars right now. They're very big. They grow quickly. Right? Here's the directorate for engineering. Is catalysis a discipline? Maybe. I don't know if your department has a, if your <laughs> university has a department of catalysis. But you see a trend here. Uh, here's geosciences, and I'm going to give you aeronomy. <laughs> right, I'm going to round up. I'll give you aeronomy. I had to look it up, and I'm not embarrassed to say I don't remember what it is, but it's very important. It has to do with gases, I think. I don't remember. Somebody correct me. Um, here's math and physical sciences. Here's statistics. Okay, clear. And I rounded up on this one, too. There's a program called Division of Chemistry Disciplinary Research Programs. But that's it. You've just looked at several hundred programs. Names like Mathematical Sciences Research Institutes tell you something about what we do and what we fund. And they're easier for people to explain. So before I show you this social me behavioral economic science list, let me say one thing that's just blunt and, bru and brutal, but true. Uh, we fund basic research. And one key thing about basic research is that if you can have a long-term stable funding commitment, people think about long-term research agendas. But if you're afraid your funding is going to go away every two or three years, people make different intellectual investments. And the country suffers and science suffers. When we talk about what we're doing, we need it in a way that reasonable people in both parties can understand it. If we have a one-party strategy, we're always going to be vulnerable. So it's just something to keep in mind as we think about what's, what's coming next. So here's our, here's our directorate. And we've got a couple. We've got archaeology, economics, linguistics, political science, and sociology. So we have more than anyone else in terms of disciplinary names. But as I mentioned before, only one of these programs draws an exceptionally unusual amount of scrutiny from our funder. Uh, so I, I want to get past this. So, so here's the idea of repositioning. So what we did with repositioning is about a year ago, 11 months ago, September 26th was the first time we presented this idea. Um, we started talking about ways that we might have a new strategy. And so here was the, stra here was the idea. We would go give a talk and we, th we would toss out different ways of describing programs. And they were all things we were actively considering. Over the last 11 months, we, we tested about 250 different concepts. And then we would try and see how people reacted and what made people upset and what said I'm excluded and who said this, because we don't really want to exclude it. There are no new exclusions in what we're talking about. We want to try and figure out what are things that will draw s scholars, but that we can also say to our funders, and what's critical when they leave room to us, have them be excited about it. So we refined a lot of our goals. Uh, we listened to a lot of internal and external stakeholders. We talked not only to scholarly organizations, a lot of different uh, philanthropies, a lot of different agencies, and many, you know, many people uh, inside and outside the building. Uh, we even opened up a, a website internally for people to give and comment about ideas that we had. So that was a new SBE at NSF.gov. So we opened that, I think, in October. And we tested over 250 concepts. And then we had two externally mandated cones of silence uh, where we weren't allowed to talk about it. One was the shutdown, because we weren't allowed to talk to our employees. And then the other is we put forward an initial version of the idea, but we're a union shop, and so we had to make sure the union was okay with it, with what we we're going to do. So if we're going to propose any changes in like job titles, or so we, so we had another five weeks where we weren't allowed to talk to our employees about it because we had to make sure the union was okay with it. So I'm just telling, this is the sequence. So we were actively uh, working, trying to get ideas, but we did have two roughly five-week periods where we weren't allowed to talk to anyone about it. And then we started uh, coding and writing. And that brought us to uh, today. Uh, really, in July, we started uh, putting pencils on paper, beginning of July. So um, here's the thing to know about the changes we're about to announce. Uh, these affect solicitations and programs in 2020 and afterwards. So for those of you who have just sent things to the political science that have met the deadline, it doesn't affect you. Right? This is if you're going to uh, uh, send things to one of nine programs in 2020 or after. Okay. So let me talk to you about some of the things we're doing. We have a program called Rider. Rider's an awesome program. Are you one of the Rider? I can't remember. Are you on the Rider group? No, Bob, no, you're not on the Rider group. Okay. Rider is, well, this is, Rider is research infrastructure and data, and there's like five other words. It's like a French word where there's like 15 things in it, but you only pronounce the first part. Uh, it's a long acronym for research data infrastructure in the social sciences. That's an important thing. 
But there's a way to build on this concept that actually gets us a little more energy and a lot more scholarly opportunity. So we're going to evolve this into a new program called Human Networks and Data Science. And in this program, if you study networks of neurons, networks of people, networks of communities, networks of cultures, and you use data, here's a lane. It's a new lane. Uh, we will be searching for a program officer in this in the coming months. So if you know anybody or you want to be the person who helps us put shape to this, we're building that. So this is taking an existing idea, making it better. We have an amazing program called CCE STEM. I don't know how many of you have heard of it. Cultivating cultures of ethics in STEM. One thing I've seen in Washington is a lot of because of like um, some of the tech problems, that the problems that tech firms have gotten, much more concerned about ethics. And social scientists, we, should be at the center of conversations about how you think about ethics, how you deal with ethics, how you integrate ethics into workflows, uh, into you know, societal decision making. But this is a little obscure. So we're building this program, right, uh, to a, a bigger one with more opportunities called Ethical and Responsible Research, where we'll be dealing with ethics. We'll be talking about if you care about reproducibility, uh, there will be opportunities here. But I think about science as service. So this is a thing where let's, you know, I don't think science should impose on people. I think science, this is just my personal belief, science should serve, serve people. But we can't pretend, we can't walk into a room and pretend we know how to do that. So research on this, we can fund basic research on how this works, and, and we should be the people doing it. We have a program called Science of Science and Innovation Policy. So one problem with this is how do you pronounce it? Is it the science of science and innovation policy, or is it the science of science and innovation policy? Right? It's, it's the, the nuance is weird, but it's a program that has great intentions, and it's funded some really good stuff, but it's a little bit hard to explain, and sometimes um, it's caused some difficulties. So uh, we're clarifying this in terms of three targets. So there's a community called Science of Science. So the program will be called Science of Science, Discovery, Communication, and Impact. The discovery is how can we improve how scientific contexts work, how they work for the people in them, who, how they work for the people who are excluded from them or could be in them. Uh, you know, how do we do mo more? How do we do better? Communication is if we produce something, how do we make sure that other people can come away with a, a better, un an accurate understanding of it? And how do we measure impact? Okay, so again, it's a way to turn an existing idea into something that is easier to explain and easier to advocate for. We have a program called Documenting Endangered Languages. It's a really good program, studies indigenous languages, does so by like comparing them, because there are many more indigenous languages and endangered languages than there are classical languages. It's very important work. But as you might imagine, in a science agency, this story becomes a little hard to tell. Document, how is documenting science? And we have a partnership with the National Endowment for the Humanities, where they fund humanities work, we fund uh, social science work, and we coordinate. We have a single stream proposal process, and we review with them, and then we separate it. But this has been confusing. So we are continuing the partnership. We're actually extending it with the National Endowment of Humanities. Theirs is gonna, their part is going to be called Documenting Endangered Languages. Our part is going to be called Dynamic Language Infrastructure because that is actually what we fund. We fund the databases, the collections that people can use, the recordings, the artifacts, and things of that nature that we can use to understand uh, sort of human interrelationships, human conceptual frameworks, how they evolve under circumstances that are you know, benign and horrible, right? But all things that can, can, can uh, uh, teach us important things, not just about language, but about each other. We have a program called Law and Social Science. It's an awesome program. Um, but there's an opportunity here, right? So suppose you're doing something in chemistry or in tech or in engineering, and, and you're trying to think about the social impact and like, you know, and how, would you come to this program? And like, oh, I'm not sure that law and social science is for me. But what if we rename this program, committed to a social scientific perspective on law, but said, look, um, this is law and science. If science is gonna come in the room and affect people, there's a huge cadre of social scientists who know how to do this. And they should be in the conversation. And we don't want people to get confused that maybe they're not, you know, if the question's about chemistry or biology or whatever, we want them to know that we're willing to do this. And so, with that, I have one reveal. Uh, so, so Reggie, uh, Dr. Sheehan, uh, is one of the program officers, and I'd like to now introduce uh, our new program officer, uh, our, who is coming back, Mark Hurwitz, is in the front row from Western Michigan. He's awesome, and he's starting again on Tuesday. 
So thank you for coming back and working with us. It was great. Thank you. So we're just adding political scientists to the staff. We're not done yet. All right, but we'll get to that. And now we have political science, okay? So the work that political scientists do is very important, but we have a problem. And I've talked about its manifestations, and it's not a theoretical problem. It comes down to our ability to help people. It comes to our ability to serve. It has had, the, the political problem we have has had detrimental effects. So what we're introducing is a program called Security and Preparedness, and a program called Accountable Institutions and Behavior. What's the logic here? I think that every person in this conference who has ever been eligible from NSF funding can write to one of these targets, right? Because the key is, like, think about what you're studying. And the question is, I I'm asking about the last two sentences of your broader impact statement. And can you link it to somebody's ability to serve someone else? If it isn't about accountability or representativeness or helping a vulnerable population, right, how do, I, how do we defend that? Everyone here can do this. So the ask of you is when you write a program name into your grant, write these words. What I want to do is reverse the polarity. If you know members of Congress, you may know that it is quite difficult or impossible for them to go in a public place and say, you know what, I have a great idea for how to spend more taxpayer dollars. I think we should spend more taxpayer dollars on basic research in political science. It's very difficult to say. Okay? Suppose we execute this correctly. We have an opportunity to reverse the polarity. We have an opportunity to put our friends who love you know, citizens and who understand the critical role of science in the life of citizens, we can put them in a, in a strategically advantageous position to advocate for the things that we do for the value that we provide. The idea is to make it easy, you know, we want to do great science. We're committed to doing great science regardless of what happens. But if we can make it easier on people who make the case for us, and just to be blunt, harder on people who like to take cheap shots at us, and they exist, right, we have a chance to reverse the polarity. And in terms of funding growth, that's the key. We need friends. We need to make it easier for people who, who want to support this and we just want other people to have to think about it. So Brian Humes couldn't be here. Many of you know Brian as the longtime program officer of uh, the National Science Foundation. I just want to say one thing personally. Um, when someone throws a rock at the political science program at NSF, it hits Brian. Like, that's a real thing. All right, so whatever you think of him, if you've funded him, if you, if you haven't funded him, he has really, you know, there have been a lot of program officers that have come in and out. But Brian, um, yeah, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's given a lot for this discipline. So that's just, that's worth knowing. So I want to write a letter. He just, he wrote a letter. Can't be here today. He said, uh, dear friends and colleagues, I apologize for not being here today. Circumstances beyond my control have prevented my attendance. Uh, I am starting my fourth decade in political science and my 15th year as a program officer in the political science program at the National Science Foundation. I have greatly enjoyed my time at NSF. I have especially liked talking to people about their research projects and how they might be made more competitive. On the negative side, I have not enjoyed the constant scrutiny the program has been under by members of Congress. There has not been a year in my tenure here when a project hasn't made a waste book or been the subject of a congressional inquiry. Dealing with these incidents takes time and effort which subtracts from our ability to do our core mission. Perhaps more troubling is there is little spoken support on the Hill. For example, recently members on both sides of the aisle have ridiculed political science as science. This is despite the fact that some of those who have attacked have also made use of NSF-funded political science research. It is clear that our research is valued. However, our program is not. We have thought long and hard about how to deal with this disconnect. We have tried various ways to get the word out about the good things political science in the program produces. Regardless of what we've done, the program has still been viewed negatively and continues to be the outcomes of criticisms. What are we to do? The new path we have chosen is to rebrand the program. Instead of being the political science program, it will become two, the security and preparedness program and the accountable institutions behavior program. This change has several advantages, and I will mention a few. First, it helps to provide a clearer notion to a lay audience of what we support. 
Well, when the average citizen hears political science, they think of government and law. If you look around this convention, it is very clear that we're much broader than that. Second, I believe this change will increase applications in some substantive areas. While we regularly fund work in international relations and comparative politics, not everyone in those areas has received that message. The rebranding can be used to appeal to scholars in these areas, as well as others, such as public policy and public administration. Third and finally, this change also puts us more in line with the rest of the foundation. Very few programs and other directorates follow disciplinary boundaries. Internally, I think it behooves us to follow this pattern. In conclusion, I support this change. I think it's best for the continued existence of political science at the National Science Foundation, and ultimately this is my goal. I want to make sure that the political science program, in whatever form, continues to exist well after my time at the foundation. I know that a number of you ha will have concerns and questions. I'm sorry I'm not there to answer them. If your questions or concerns are not answered here, feel free to contact me at bhumes at nsf.gov, and we'll give you all our email addresses after that. Uh, we can correspond by email or set up a phone conversation. So. Uh, Brian wanted to be here, he can't today, but he's, um, he's really given a lot to all of us. I mean, he's a, I don't think, if you don't know him, it's, he's sort of a silent rock uh, under everything we do. And just, it's hard to say enough about, about what he's done. Um, so these are all the programs that we're changing, right? There's a couple that I, I, I haven't mentioned, but you know, we have a science of learning program. We're adding augmented intelligence. That's a critical distinction. It's not artificial intelligence, because artificial intelligence is where you use code to replace people. Augmented intelligence is where you use code to empower people. Right. Uh, science and technology studies. We have a science, technology, and society. The community actually asks us for that change, because it represents what they do. So uh, that is, uh, and then partnerships. I talked about that before. We are pursuing them rigorously, because there's a lot of good we can do, and there's a lot of people, there's more people we're building momentum about people who understand the value of what we do. All right, um, so with partnerships in mind, if you were on Twitter yesterday, uh, we made a pretty big reveal that we've been sitting on for about six months. Um, we hired uh, Danny Goroff. Uh, for those of you who know anything about the philanthropic world, uh, Danny Goroff's a giant. Uh, he's been a vice president of the Sloan Foundation. He was at the, on the Harvard faculty for, for 20 years. He's a huge visionary, and we've been working on this for months. Uh, so he's got, like, I am at the University of Michigan and NSF. They, they share me. Danny's going to be at both places. Danny will be the director of the Social and Economic Sciences Division that includes political science. But he's also going to help us with partnerships because he's amazing. Uh, so we announced that yesterday. We're putting the band back together. You know, we're bringing in some, some powerhouses, and we're not done yet. I got one more. I have one more reveal for you in a moment. I just want to talk about a couple future concepts, and we'll open it up to questions. We're working on a, these are all pre-decisional, they're things we're thinking about. We're working on strengthening American infrastructure. So this is an idea where if we're trying to build infrastructure of all kinds, make sure the social scientists are there on day one uh, so that the infrastructure serves people, okay? Another is a concept called build and broaden. Um, today, uh, many universities in this organization are doing more and more about to diversify and broaden participation. Um, but I wanna bring it to scale. And so, um, even today, most uh, African-American college students are not at R1s. And most uh, Latino, Latinx uh, students are not at R1s. And most Native American students are not at R1s. And they're mostly who we fund. So suppose we did the following. Suppose initially just us, and then in the near future, us and partners said the following. Any university in this country propose something to us. And if you're willing to do, I don't know, 50% of the work at a minority serving institution with the staff and students of a minority serving institution physically there. Maybe there's extra money available for that and maybe there's a lot, right? This is a way to bring people in and build capacity. Right now, you know, I, I spoke to the vice president of research at um, New Mexico State University, which is a minority serving institution in Las Cruces, New Mexico. He wants to give his students research opportunities. Uh, they don't have the budget for it but I can imagine a many, many of our universities, and they're, they're in a very interesting part of the world where one might want to conduct research. Let's do it there. We don't just hop in and hop out. Let's do it there, build, in, build capacity, build a legacy so that there is more capacity, there is more community that can, so we can fund them in the future so that everybody can be more competitive. I think this is a way to, so build and broaden as a concept and continued participation in the big ideas the big ideas are cross-directorate things at NSF. Uh, some of you know, because Apps announced it the other day, uh, a group of political scientists got a $1 million award 
uh, from NSF uh, to deal with sexual harassment in this discipline. Uh, to study all manner, did you not know this? All manner of uh, try and collect data, do interviews and all this, but why it's happening and how to, how to, how to deal with it. And again, you, you might say, we only fund uh, basic research, we do. Political science ain't the only discipline that has this problem. But we have people who can collect data. We have people who understand the context. We have people who can maybe get underneath this in a way that other disciplines can't, and then it can be applied elsewhere. So it was the right move. A great group of scholars applied for it, and that's the game we want to be in, right? Real, real value. Okay. So um, that would be the end of my story, but I have, um, I have one more thing I want to tell you, okay? So um, in this new world with the new programs, Zaryab, is going to run the security preparedness program. Brian Humes is gonna become a senior science advisor. He's gonna help us, he's amazing. He's gonna help us coordinate the programs and do lots of other great things at NSF to empower. But that means we have an open chair. Look, an open chair. We have an open chair for the program officer for accountable institutions and behavior. So what I'd like to do is, for the first time, tell you who that is, all right? Oh, look, it's the NSF logo. We have to go one more slide. <laughs> so I, I wanted to bring in, when we brought in Danny Goroff, we wanted to bring in a rock star. And when we wanted to stand up this program and send a message to political science about how seriously we take it, how much we want to cover everything, we needed a person with a certain stature and visibility and credibility who could help us shape that and send the signal about what this program is all about. You want to come up? You don't have, you don't have. It's Jan. So this is so cool. So thank you. It, so I'm sure you know but Jan's a political science PhD, so we're just, you know, we're way past the quota now. Uh, has been on the faculty at, Amer is at American, has been at Arizona at A&M. Editor extraordinaire. I mean, how many people have edited two of the top journals? And she did one of them twice, right? Uh, in an, uh, an incredible circumstance that none of us welcome, but, you know, when the field needed someone to come in, and it's you, right? And we're just, I'm just, and got a good now award the other day. So I'm just, I, uh, so anyways. So you start next week too, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, anyways, uh, I guess maybe it's time for, qu I have one more reveal, but I'll show it in a second. How much time do we have? What time does this end? Okay, we should probably take questions and then like I need five minutes at the end to reveal something that I inadvertently revealed earlier. But yeah, we'll take questions. Do you want, is it easier, how do you want to do the questions so you can record? They need to speak into the microphone okay. to be All right. Heard. So if you're sitting in the back, I'm going to have to bring it to you. Professor? Thank you, Skip. And I think that the uh, concerns you expressed about the need to show the broader impact of political science to make sure that the work that we do is shown to serve people uh, are enormously important concerns that are shared by uh, the APSA Council. Uh, I do have some concerns about your coding decisions, and that includes the uh, recoding of uh, political science. Uh, when you indicated uh, that uh, most of your programs don't have disciplinary names, and you only put some in red. Uh, you left out programs like cultural anthropology, which has a disciplinary name as part of it, like social psychology, which has a disciplinary name as part of it. And a lot of those engineering programs had engineering as part of it. And you didn't count them because it wasn't solely anthropology or psychology or engineering. But the rebranding that we're doing uh, for political science programs eliminates political science entirely. It's not part of any title anywhere. And 
I understand that focusing on Congress, you feel this will be helpful in getting funding, and that's very important from the standpoint of the SBE directorate. You also stress that the SBE work has worldwide impact. And from the perspective of the American Political Science Association, uh, we are deeply concerned. We are hearing from political scientists around the country and political science departments around the country and political scientists around the world that our discipline is, uh, does have a lot of critics. And uh, part of the answer is not to rebrand in many institutions, it's to downsize, restructure, eliminate. And we're, and in other countries of the world, we have regimes that are working actively to eliminate political sciences, right, to eliminate departments, and to um, uh, 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 end employment for political science. We have already heard, as a result of this change, concerns from political scientists and departments in this country and uh, others that NSF will be sending a signal that political science is not a discipline that counts. And they're not going to be looking at the PhDs of all you in order to decide. They're going to look at NSF ended political science and has reprogrammed two new programs with labels that you believe encompasses everything, but that uh, it's not immediately obvious to a lot of political scientists who've looked at those labels uh, that their work falls under it. At any rate, there is a message to institutions around the world that the NSF doesn't think political science is something it should support. And I, we do need you to address these concerns. I call you Mr. President? <laughs> um, yeah. No, I mean, your concerns are, you know, I mean, they're valid, right? And so, you know, at, at some level, not to be presumptive, but, you know, we want a lot of the same things and we want to help a lot of the same people. Um, so I, you know, in the strategy that, that we have or in the, the, the way that we're thinking about it, like, what is the best way to make the case for the value of political science? We think it's to talk about what it, you know, to show you the value. I mean, when you think about a brand, like how do you build a brand? Most people know like Apple or Disney, not because they take an inventory of like everything it does, it's because it has a couple of iconic products. And when you see the icon and it, you, you uh, form an emotional attachment to it, you then become accepting of the category. Like Apple has such a powerful brand that if tomorrow I said, oh, guess, guess what, behind the screen I have an eye dog. Like there's an iPhone, an iPad, there's an iDog. I think we all have a sense of what it would look like. Like it'd have smooth and a simple user interface and it would work right out of the box, right? A powerful brand has that. But the way that you have to build a brand is not, that. like the Apple symbol is like meaningless, right? You've gotta have the iconic connection before the brand can mean anything. We believe that these, these channels, these targets, these beacons, are the basis of a brand rebuild, right? We think that they are a way, not just in NSF, but to help the federal government and many of its constituents as a whole say, oh, I thought of jumbo shrimp first and political science, oh, but you guys do this. Like, here's the situation I want to create. When somebody's in a room and they're thinking of coming after us, I want somebody else to say, no, 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 wait a minute, they're the ones who do this. And we don't have that right now in enough rooms. There are so many people who think they can just swing at us and because they just do it. And, you know, I, I just, I want them to stop, like, maybe they're right, you know, maybe we're all, uh, but I don't think so. I think we're awesome. So I want to make it easier for our people who love us and harder for people who don't. Uh, so anyways, that's, so it's in the brand building exercise, it's building the iconic products to establish the brand. Now, you know, we're not running away from it, right? So when we, I guess I'll just show you right now. Um, so last night we got clearance to show you the program descriptions. So for a long time we've been talking with people for about a year and some of you have asked can we see the program descriptions and the reason and the answer is we can't because we're not allowed to show you before everybody can see it. Right? That's just like that, that's an NSF rule, right? So uh, but we got permission last night to show you. 
So let me show you what's in the program description if you want to say, okay, oh, so I, I apologize, I mean, we haven't, we've been playing by the rules. So here is accountable institutions and behavior. I'll, I'll read it to you if you want. So accountable institutions, the accountable institutions behavior program supports basic scientific research that advances knowledge and understanding of issues broadly related to attitudes, behavior, and institutions connected to public policy and the provision of public services. Research proposals are expected to be theoretically motivated, conceptually precise, methodologically rigorous, and empirically oriented. Substantive areas include, but are not limited to, the study of individual and group decision making, political institutions appointed or elected, attitude and preference formation and expression, electoral processes and voting, public administration and public policy. This work can focus on a single case or can be done in a comparative context, either over time or cross-sectionally. The program does not fund applied research. If you're saying, what? We've never done that, right? That's not right. Uh, the program also supports research experiences for undergraduate students and infrastructural activities, including methodological in innovations. In addition, we encourage you to examine the websites for the National Science Foundation's Law and Science and Security and Preparedness programs. So let me read Security and Preparedness now, because we have that up too. Forgive me, I'm going to read it to you. Some of it's like the same boilerplate, but I just want to be fair. The Security and Preparedness Program supports basic scientific research that advances knowledge and understanding of issues broadly related to global and national security. Research proposals are evaluated on the criteria of intellectual merit and broader impacts. The proposed projects are expected to be theoretically motivated, conceptually precise, methodologically rigorous, and empirically oriented. Substantive areas include, but are not limited to, international relations, global and national security, human security, political violence, state stability, conflict processes, regime transition, international and comparative political economy, and peace science. Moreover, the rest of the sentences are the same as before. So we want to make it so that you can see yourself in it. Um, and if you're confused or if you think both programs, that's always been the case because we've always had, can you go to decision science? And here's another thing, just for what it's worth, you might say, oh, but other people than political scientists might apply for this program and get money. Newsflash, that's always been the case. The political science program has funded many non-political scientists and we proudly have funded political scientists in many other programs, right? So there's, there's not a change there. But anyways, Professor Hochschild. Thanks, Gibbs. This is enormously informative. And thanks to all the rest of you. We all are in this room because we really appreciate what you guys do. Um, so I have two questions. One is I don't think you've quite answered Roger's question about what the implications are for people outside this room or even outside the American Political Science Association yeah. who, for whom the message about branding and Congress and, you know, is that that's a really complicated message. It's taken you close to an hour to tell us in enough detail so that we get it. So I, I think Roger's question remains on the floor. Um, the other question I have is about these particular programs. This may be probably a question for program officers. I, it seems to me there are two possibilities. One is that more or less all of our work will fit into one or the other of them. And so there isn't a deep substantive change in what NSF is going to fund in terms of political science research. And, and if that's true, the goal is to make sure that the right people understand that and the wrong people don't, right? I mean, so that we're really still doing political science, we're just rebranding it, but don't anybody worry about, you know, whether my research on the incorporation of genomics and politics, incorporation of Muslim, it, it's going to fit somewhere. It doesn't quite sound like one of these two programs, but, but I can make it fit, so long as I pay attention to public impact and so on, taking your message. The other logic is that, no, actually, that's not right, that the purpose of this is genuinely to change, shift, modulate, adjust the kind of political science research that's being funded because the need for public visibility, recognition, acceptance, in which case some political scientists will no longer be appropriate applicants. Yeah. And, and I think I hear you saying both, uh, and, and maybe more the former than the latter, but if it's more the former than just branding, it, it, which takes me back to Rogers' question, if it's really just as a kind of an internal political rebranding, the message that goes out across the world is going to feel quite different. So, so I'm just confused about, sure. it, is it really just rebranding and we should all do what we've been doing anyway, or is it genuinely shifting the content? Thank you. So, you know, 
we can keep doing what we've been doing. And the trajectory and outcomes are really clear. Yeah, now, my question is about us as scholars. Yeah, yeah. So I figure okay, out which of sure. these two I come closest to yeah. and just go ahead and apply? So, or yeah, the top line answer to the question is we, we need a broader lane and greater leverage to build a case for funding your research. Like, that's what we need. We have had a, a, a decade of pretty serious decline. So how do we do that? How do we do that? So what we're doing is establishing different, what we are clearly doing is establishing different targets, different focal points. So we had a target called political science, and we asked people to write to that. And now we're establishing two targets, security and preparedness and accountable institutions and behavior. My belief is, so let me have one caveat. Foundation-wide, we can only fund about one out of every five things that we get. And I'm not allowed to say what's true in the division, but I'll just say it's not an outlier. So, you know, we, we fund a portfolio, and the stronger case we can make for it, so in my, I want to say one, one thing. There are no bad people and good people in this, just in, in the world that I live in. I mean, we're trying to serve people, and we, as a government agency, we have to serve everybody in the country, right? I mean, that, that's our obligation, so there's no bad people in this. But what there is, is, is competition for dollars and competition for support, and I do not like being told to sit down and shut up I do not like being told, well, you need to keep a low profile because if you, if you stick your head up, you're going to get in trouble. And I've told all these things. I am not a sit down. I believe in us. I believe in what we do. Do I know what the ultimate portfolio will look like? No. If we ask people to write to different targets, will we get a different type of research? Probably. Do I know ex ante what it is? Not at all. Not at all. And th I think that's really critical. Like, you know, let's think about a type of research like, well, political science has been funding them and maybe NSF doesn't want to fund it. If we can build a bridge between this work that someone's proposing and an outcome that can transform people's life, I will go to the wall for it. We will go, that's what we do. We talked about it before. We do not make political decisions when, we fun, when, when we're talking about individual proposals. We will go for the, to the wall for anything that advances the mission of the agency. We just need to take the shackles off. And some of the shackles are people hit us with this stereotype of what they think political science is. And so at many levels, when we try to redirect money to a program like this, we get told it's not a good idea, all right? And so that's unacceptable, right? That, that's, that's unacceptable. So the w you know, I don't know, I, I hope I'm answering your question. I have no ex-ante expectation about who loses. I, I think who loses are, are just, you know, if we, really if we really think about this the right way, who wins are people who can do whatever type of rigorous research they're doing and make the better case for how this work could, because we only fund basic research, transform people's lives and help us serve others and help us serve populations we can't see. That is critical to us. And if we have that corpus and we have that ecosystem, it's going to, you know, we have, I'm sorry, just to be blunt, we have more leverage. We have intellectual leverage. We, we have leverage with respect to outcomes. And I, we just think it's worth fighting for. So let me I want to make sure. Thank you. Hi. <coughs> Thanks uh, for the opportunity to speak on this. Uh, I wasn't anticipating speaking today, but um, I feel the urge to do so now. Um, we're being told that the motive for this change is to sort of depoliticize political science. That there are these political pressures, and that it would be naive to not acknowledge them. And by doing this and creating these two different titles, that we are somehow, political science will not be a target. But in fact, I think it's exactly the opposite. It would be naive to not think that our research will inevitably be pitched, specifically this title, Security and Preparedness, that research proposals will be shaped with this title in mind. Um, and not only that, but that I would say that in terms of coming under the microscope and becoming a target, this actually makes us more of a target. Because when the proposals come in and, you know, somebody uh, from Congress, as you, the example that you give, comes and takes a, looks at, like, takes a look at them and discovers that, well, in fact, this isn't about se security and preparedness, it's about something else. Those political scientists are at it again to, um, you know, that are working against these important, you know, values of, of, of national security. So I, I just, I think that I, I don't buy the logic that this somehow is, is 
necessary politically, um, and that uh, and that by doing so, it somehow will, you know, depoliticize the situation. This is this is politicizing uh, the work that we do, I think, and making us more of a target. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we have to make the case, you know, to every member of Congress. We we have, uh, you know, I so I, I appreciate your point of view. Um, you know, we have a different one. Yeah. Do you want to do you want to come up or? I don't know if I can get it back to you. Hi. Hi. Like you, I was not planning to speak. Um, but I, I did want to raise just a couple of things. First of all, I feel like I stepped into Mary Poppins. It's like a spoonful of sugar, right? Take your medicine, this is a spoonful of sugar. So I appreciate that, but I'm also perplexed by my own reaction. Um, one of the concerns that I have is um, that maybe we're fighting last decade's fight, right? So I'm not certain. It sounds like we're looking forward, but I'm not certain that that is in fact the case. Oftentimes in crisis, we fight the last one and not the one that's coming 20 years from now. So this might be a nimble way to respond, or it might actually be another way to, to, to find a new target that, um, that we're gonna become. Part of the problem for us is that <coughs> politics is in our name and nobody likes politics or politicians, right? So if we were called colonoscopy, we'd be in the same kind of situation, right? <laughs> so we'd have to figure out a way to make that go away. So um, and when we look at the other directorates, what we actually see is in their title, they exist, biological sciences, right? I mean, so when we remove political science from SBE, political science, it seems to me, becomes more suspect. So it can become suspect, I think, as Rogers mentioned, in departments across the country, um, like the one that, uh, the ones in certain states, like North Carolina, right, where they're much more reactive, or um, internationally, right? Um, and so those are some of the concerns that I have. And also about the unintended consequences. Who actually does get lift out? You can't predict it, so we're actually taking a gamble here. I like the idea of it. I'm very, very, very fundamentally concerned about the unanswered questions. I don't know if there's a way that we can put politics back in some place, because politics is the thing that you're actually responding to. But that is actually the thing that we study. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure we can do it. Maybe. OK, thanks, Skip. Uh, dating myself, I was on the uh, the political science panel in the 1970s. And we were told when we arrived in DC that we could not fund any, uh, any studies of Congress because they didn't like themselves to be studied. And so we abided by that rule. This was the time of the Proxmire Golden Fleece Awards. And they went not just to political scientists, but they also went to psychologists. So a very eminent psychologist at the University of Minnesota, she was a Regents professor, and she studied love. And Mr. Proxmire thought that was really a waste of the taxpayers' money, and he said so in no uncertain terms. So today's crisis is not the first crisis that political science has ever suffered at the NSF. And so I just wanted to call your attention, uh, your attention to that, and nobody, changed the name of political science um, at that time. My other uh, point is that within uh, the directorate, the other social scientific uh, disciplines are still there with their uh, disciplinary names. So you've got sociology, anthropology, both of which I would have a lot more trouble defending <laughs> to a congressperson than I would political science. And of course you have economics, the you know, queen bee of the social sciences, and we know why they don't get, uh, get picked on. But I just wanna make sure that this is not um, a short-sighted response to the current moment in politics. Um, I doubt that it is because you've outlined how long and hard you've studied this. The, um, the last thing is I also have concerns about how all political scientists are gonna fit into those two buckets. 
and it's not clear to me that public policy fits into one of the buckets. It's not clear to me that comparative politics fits in one of the buckets. And also certain topics within international relations, they don't have anything to do with security, but they're very important topics. And so I, I worry about that. Thank you very much. I'm Julie Taylor. I'm with the Fulbright program. And so I can understand your concerns on congressional funding. They're very real. We get cut. Uh, but there's two ways that we've, uh, there's a way that we've dealt with this which is very different. We deal with international exchange, which isn't very popular under this administration. We didn't change it to like globalizing the U.S. workforce or something like that, which would be more impactful. We stuck with, we support international exchange. But I work for IIE, which is the implementing agency. There are other implementing agencies. Then there's associations. So there's a whole constellation of people who are stakeholders and who are friends of the same objective as the State Department has. And they can advocate in Congress on our behalf. And they've actually raised our budget over the last two years despite the cuts. So I'm wondering, what is that constellation of stakeholders for you? And are you able to mobilize them? Or is it just too difficult? So, I'll, I promise I'll be quick. Um, as a government employee, I'm, I'm not allowed to lobby. So uh, there, there are all kinds of things that we cannot do. But we can aggressively and affirmatively make the case for the value of, of the work. And so, you know, what we're trying to do is, is, is that. And so, in coming up with these ideas, we've actually talked to and listened to a lot of people to think about how could they make the case for this more effectively? What are the terms and words that they could use to get to the outcome that we want, which is actually to serve? So I'll say that. I, uh, there's one other thing I just want to point out, and it's a historical point. I, again, I actually respect uh, you know, all the elected representatives in Washington, in part because you know, it's not trivial to get there, and in part they just represent different people. If we think that this is about a moment, in this moment, I just want to ask you a question. When the Coburn Amendment was passed, what was the makeup of the government? What was the makeup of the government? What party controlled the Senate? What party controlled the executive branch? This isn't of the moment. This is an ongoing challenge. You go look it up if you don't know. Might not be the one you think. And it's not because, it's just the, it's the politics, it's the brass knuckles negotiation, because at the end of the day, you're not given things, right? So I'm grateful for you coming here. It's grateful to, I'm grateful for the views that you've expressed. At the end of the day, we want to create more opportunities, and we're trying to figure out how, how to get this. You know, uh, we're open to ideas. We like, you know, ideas that are better than ours, um, you know, and ideas that can reverse the trend that we've seen over the last multiple years. So thank you for your support, and uh, we look forward to continue. And thank you to our, our wonderful panel. Thank you. And we uh, look forward to, you know, whatever we end up doing, uh, the quality of, of what we end up producing depends on what you send. That's the end of the day, and what your students send and so forth. We actually can't make the outcome happen. It depends on what you send. So uh, in terms of how we go forward, uh, please encourage your students to participate not just in our programs, but in the big ideas and the opportunities to broaden participation. There's lots of opportunities. There's lots of lanes. So thank you very much. <laughs>